It's the 31st of July, 2021. So I've been doing the evening chanting, and in this we recollect the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So this is appropriate for us who have faith, faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And so we develop this as a meditation object, as our kamatana. This kamatana, it's a basis for our work. And so our hearts need this strong basis, strong foundation. And then we take this work as our means for training our hearts. We think about the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha as the object, the focal point of our hearts. And we can also think about the ways in which we've sacrificed and created merit, the food that we've offered, how we've um, given dwellings to the monks, or we have offered other of the uh, four requisites, um, clothing, the robes, and medicines, or the ways in which we've helped out society and been of assistance to each other. So how about the monks, and the monks are those who have faith already. And um, they have this devotion towards building goodness. And so when we see others, or know of others, creating goodness, amigava and amodana, uh, we rejoice in their goodness. And we can also recollect their goodness, or our own goodness, um, that we've built. And this fills up our heart with joy. So it's really important for us to be sincere. And this sincerity, this firmness, um, devotion, it's um, one of the qualities which leads us towards success. And so there are really four of these qualities. Um, there's chanda, this satisfaction or the, the pleasure that we take in what we're doing. And then virya, uh, effort and jitta, the focus, and we monks are our um, uh, contemplation or analysis of what we're doing. And so with uh, chanda, this satisfaction in what we're doing, um, for monks this means that we have this, this uh, pleasure that we take in maintaining the standards of the monastery, of our tradition, that we sit in meditation, we cultivate our minds, we go to the morning and evening chanting, and we help out with the duties and the work of the monastery, and we do this together. We join together, we finish the work together. So in the first year that I went to Watnobapong, Lumpur Cha's monastery, they were building the Ubosita Hall, and so we had the work of carrying the earth up and pounding that earth so that it was strong, it would make a strong foundation. And so we would carry on doing this um, and then finish up late at night and we'd have a shower at about 11 p.m. and get to rest at about midnight and then have to wake up at 3 for the morning chanting. And when we showered in the evening, it was very cold. And when we were doing the chanting, we were all sitting on a marble floor, and we just had our sitting cloth underneath us. So the floor was very cold. And in both the rainy season and the wet season, it was, it was very um, chilly, chanting like that. And things weren't easy like they are now. We didn't have a carpet. We didn't have sitting mats. It was just the very senior monks, uh, Lumpur Liam, Lumpur Bunchu, maybe three or four monks who um, had these mats. But for the rest of us, uh, we had to tough it out. And so we depended upon the strength of our endurance, our forbearance. So this quality of sacrifice in our sincerity that we have, this focus that we have, it's something that's really important in our faith as well. And so when we do these things, then we try to do them well. 
um, we do this court, we keep the standards of practice um, and the schedule of the monastery. And we put in our focus and we uh, put in our effort too. Because we've all heard that the saying of the Buddha that we're able, only able to free ourselves from suffering due to our efforts. So we must put in this effort, we must be determined to walk in meditation, to sit in meditation, and to do this without skipping out on it. So this quality of effort is something that's really important and something that we must be applying consistently. And this is the work, the duties of meditation monks and also of meditation laity as well. Because none of us know how long this life will last for. And we can see in the current state of the world that many people are dying and this is happening all over the world, that people are passing away due to this pandemic. And perhaps for this, we haven't seen it for ourselves, but we've heard about it occurring in history, during the time of the Buddha in Vaisali, um, that there was a pandemic, a very severe pandemic that spread then. And so this is something that seems to happen about every 100 years in the world, that there's a severe pandemic that spreads around. And so this 100 years, we're meeting with the COVID virus. And for some people, it's very difficult for them to live their lives, that they need to be really careful, really cautious um, when they go out to try to make their way in the world, to try to make a living. And this is very similar to animals. We can see that in animals, that when they go out to look for food, they always need to be cautious, need to be aware. And they're very afraid of the many dangers around them. For mice, they're afraid of hawks. For deers, they're afraid of tigers and lions and other carnivorous animals. And there are many dangers there, so they need to be very cautious. So it's the same for people in this day and age. When they go out looking for food, they have to be very careful, very careful that they may be getting, or that this, this COVID virus uh, may be around them. But if we look at this through the lens of Dhamma, we see that the reason that we have to suffer because of Maintaining our lives and supporting our lives is due to this body. That this body, it needs food, it needs water to survive. And it's really tough now um, that it's difficult for some people to find that food. And um, it can be very tough on them. But we must train ourselves in this current situation because we can't expect things to be like they were before. We can't expect for the economy to just turn back and be like what it was. So we have to train. And perhaps we need to eat less than we did before. Maybe eat half of what we used to. And it's possible for us to survive on this. We see people who are lost in the forest, that they can just have water for many days. And um, they don't die, they can survive. So we must contemplate this current state in terms of Dhamma, how the suffering is coming up due to the body and its dependence upon food and water. And so we look into this nature of suffering and see how sankharas, these conditioned phenomena, they're a cause of dukkha, a cause of stress or suffering. Some people ask why are people different, that some get sick and die as children, some even die while they're in the womb. Some people live to an old, ripe age and some die quite young. And this is due to the karma that we have created. And if people live a long life, that's due to their karma as well. So we need to be cautious because we just don't know what karma that we've created in the past. We don't know what acts we've done before. And so what we try to do is make our karma in the present moment as good as we can. 
to be kind, to be helping one another, and we can spread the merits, share the merits that we gain with our karmic debtors, those beings that we've harmed in the past. And then we recollect and think about the Buddha a lot, his virtues a lot. We can chant it to be so, the recollection of the Buddha 108 times and do this for many, many rounds. And be cultivating metta. And um, we do this in part to keep ourselves safe, to keep ourselves healthy. And so that we also have time to practice that we wish for a healthy body so we can practice further, so that we can see the Dhamma before we die. But whether we die quickly or we die slowly, we all need to die. It's necessary for all of us to pass away. So we should ensure that we die with wealth, with wealth that we can take with us. Because this external wealth, it can't follow us along past death. And it doesn't matter how much gain we've had, how much, or how high our status has been, how much praise we've received, how much pleasure we've had in this life. None of that can follow us along. Even if we're incredibly rich, we're millionaires, billionaires, our wealth, it can't follow us along, we can't take it with us. So what we need is a wealth that we can take. And that's the wealth of our generosity, the wealth of our virtue, the wealth of our meditation, our mental cultivation, and the wealth that we gain from seeing the Dhamma. So seeing the Dhamma, is it something difficult? Well, it's just right. It's not too difficult, and it's not too easy either. And it's not difficult in that all we have to do is see that there's no true self, there's no me, there's no other. And in doing that, we see the Dhamma. And so it's not hard. But the cultivation of the wisdom that we need in order to see in that light, um, that requires our practice. That requires our focus, our effort, our endurance. It requires a lot of practice. Something we have to do a lot, cultivate a lot. And so we do this, we engage in this, we meditate, we cultivate our minds without skipping. We do this every day. So this quality of uh, vimangsa, this um, analysis, it's a kind of wisdom. This is wisdom practice. And then jitta is this focus, this intent. So we use these to contemplate the nature of arising, persisting, and ceasing, arising, persisting, and ceasing. And we can ask ourselves all of the things that we've experienced during this day, all of the things that have come up, all of the sights that we've seen, all of the sounds, the tastes, the odors, the tactile sensations, the thoughts, the emotions, all of these have come and they've gone already. And that's what's led us to this current second. So all the things in the past have arisen and have ceased. All of the things in this present moment are arising and ceasing. So just like my voice as I'm talking, this is arising and ceasing right here and now. And then for everyone listening, the monastics, the laity, this listening is arising and ceasing. In everything that will happen in the following second, this too arises and ceases in the future. So all there is is this arising, persisting, and ceasing. And if we see this, then wisdom arises. And so this vimangsa, this analysis, um, gives rise to wisdom. And we have a mind which is focused and interested um, in the Dhamma, in this contemplation. And when this um, wisdom arises, then it will be able to extract all of the liking and disliking from the heart because it sees that there really isn't anything there at all. There's just arising and ceasing. So we can ask ourselves, are we getting too attracted? Are we getting too averse to things? 
And uh, we know what the mind is like. We know what state that it's in. And then we bring our focus to this practice. And we try to improve our hearts, to make them better, to not be heedless, to cultivate this way of sila, samadhi, and panya, of virtue, collectedness, and wisdom. And um, to really sincerely do this. So these itipadas, the four itipadas, these are the qualities, the dhammas, which take us to success, allow us to succeed. To succeed both in worldly things and in the dhamma as well. So when we're studying at school, we need these four itipadas to succeed. When we go out to work, we need them as well. And when we practice dhamma, we need them too in order to succeed. And so we use these, we apply these um, in our practice of the Dhamma, in cultivating the Dhamma. And um, we see that the monks from overseas who have come here to ordain, and the lay people overseas who are practicing, they have this real sincere sincerity sincerity, um, in the practice in order to meet with peace. So we can observe how the things that destroy our peace are liking and disliking. It's attraction and diversion. So we need to try to bring stability to the heart. And we do this through bringing up a meditation object. For those people who are of the temperament or the character type to have faith, um, then the recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha are appropriate objects. We could recollect death, recollect uh, virtue as the objects of our recollection, or to recollect the devas, these heavenly beings, and the inner qualities that they have, these two qualities of hiri and otapa, uh, this wholesome fear and shame of wrongdoing. If while we're meditating and we feel drowsy, then we should open up our eyes. And if the mind's really scattered and unsettled, then we chant, and we do this a lot and very fast within the mind, not allowing any space for thoughts to come in and intersect or interrupt. And then when the mind has been brought to a still and peaceful place, then we can just recite Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, as we're walking in meditation, recite Buddha, Dhammo, Sangho. And we may ask, what are we going to get from this? But just don't get into that. Don't think about that. Just do it first. Don't allow the mind to follow these kinds of thoughts, but try it out, and you'll see for yourself. So really train. Really do this. Be sincere. Don't hold back. And if we do it for real, then we'll get real results. If there's painful feelings while we're sitting, then we look and observe those, that Vedana, those painful feelings. And as we carry on practicing like this, then peace will have to arise. But what about right in the beginning, when we first practice? Is it peaceful then? Well, everyone's stirred up. Everyone's minds is a bit of a mess at the beginning. And we see that the days in which we don't keep our composure that we don't maintain restraint, then the mind will be very stirred up then. And this happened to me before I ordained, and that on the days in which I wasn't very collected, um, then there was a lot of disturbance in the mind. My mind wasn't peaceful at all. But if I was cautious and restrained, then it would come into peace. Well, sometimes also I needed to use a lot of thoughts, a lot of contemplation, um, proliferation even, in order to bring the mind to peace. So I used the body as the object of this. And at times there was just a small amount of peace that came up. And this kanaka samadhi, this small degree of samadhi. And it would take quite a long time of sitting before there was a lightness that occurred within the body. Before I could meet with upajara samadhi, this neighborhood samadhi. And there the mind felt quite cool and at ease. And then as I carried on sitting, 
Sometimes it felt like both my hands and my feet just disappeared. And sometimes it felt like half of my body was gone. There was a feeling of inner buoyancy. And if that lightness grows and grows, then it feels like there's no body there at all, like we're just floating in the air. The Both the body and the mind are very light. And when the mind and the body are in this state, they're um, appropriate, in an appropriate state to be used, to be put to work. And so we try to practice in this way. We develop samadhi constantly like this. We have effort and energy in this practice. And when we gain results, that's when a lot of energy comes up, because we see the results, we see that peace there for ourselves. And in this case, then these feelings of attraction and aversion, this pleasure and displeasure, steadily reduce. But before, it's often the case, before we get to this point, that there just isn't much peace there in the mind. If we experience um, anything, a sense impression, which forms the foundation for liking to arise, then that liking comes up and we attach to it. If we experience a sense impression that's the foundation for disliking to arise, then that occurs and we attach to it. That there's always this greed, hatred and delusion coming up. But we bear with that, we endure with that. Because we need to bring up this effort we need to bring up this endurance. And we think that one day we're going to have to defeat these. And maybe in the near future that's not going to be 100%. But at the very least we need to defeat them to some degree, these defilements. To make them lighter, to reduce them. So we try to do this. And as we carry on doing it, then just one day things come together. The mind gathers together. We see the state of the Dhamma. We see this with clarity. See how there's no self. There's no me, no other. And our faith becomes firm here at this point. So we can observe how there are people dying every day due to COVID. And for us, we just don't know whether this is going to happen to us or not. But we do see it around us. And so we should bring this back into ourselves and reflect upon ourselves as well. Um, That there's so much death that's happening. And if people are still attached to me and mine, attached to the sense of self, then this will cause a lot of suffering for them. And that we don't want to meet with this suffering. And that's the state of affairs when we don't yet understand the Dhamma. So it's important that upon knowing about death, upon seeing death, that we reflect on that and bring that within ourselves, that I too will have to die, that I shouldn't be heedless, because I don't know which day this is going to happen on. So we try to build up goodness. We chant, we practice. And if there are those going through difficulty, then we have kindness and compassion towards them. We develop these thoughts of wishing to help them out. And we can do this. We can help out society in many ways, distributing food or medical equipment. And I rejoice in the goodness um, of everyone who does all of these deeds, who helps each other out in this way. And sometimes um, a child's parents both have died and they become orphans. But there are those who have kindness and compassion for these children uh, to help them out. And so King Rama X, uh, Vajira Longkorn of Thailand, and he has this kindness and compassion, and he's um, taken care of two orphans um, now. Um, and so our society is very fortunate, 
and that the people are going through a hard time, but the king has kindness and compassion towards them. So we can take him as our example um, to cultivate this quality, this dhamma of metta, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion, and to help each other out. And we shouldn't lay blame upon one another or go accusing each other, but rather give a helping hand. And we do this through the energy of our body, our speech, and our hearts. And this is what will allow a country to pass through this difficult time, to make it through this time. And this is the same overseas as well. The people in whatever countries you live in need to help each other out. And for any country which has gotten through this already, they're in a better state, um, then you should help out other countries. Because we all live in this world together. We've all been born in this world together. And we must grow old, we must get sick, we must die together. So we should use our time to cultivate merits, to cultivate our barami, spiritual perfections, and to bring our minds to peace, to see the danger in sangsara, birth and death, and really put our focus into this practice. And if we can do that, then in no long time we will see the Dhamma. We'll see all physical things, all mental things, as being unstable and constant. And when we see this, then the heart fills up with joy. This can happen for three days and three nights, and that's just the beginning of it. So we should practice together. And for the monks here, many have been ordained for five years, ten years, twenty years, and that's no small feat, it's no easy thing. Uh, to have that sincerity, um, to stay in the robes and to bring up this energy, and to cultivate uh, Barami. And so the lay people have been supporting us and have this kindness to support us. And so we should really be sincere. And it's also true for the lay people as well. We should all be sincere to practice. So we bring up um, this inner motivation and sincerity because the Dhamma, it's timeless, that it gives results independent of time. And so we put in our efforts consistently every day without missing out. For those who have faith and sincerity in the standards of practice, um, who can chant, go to the morning chanting, the evening chanting, to fulfill their daily duties as monks, that Lumpur Cha, he said that that monk has energy, that he would look at those monks and say that that monk has energy. So we should set our hearts on this, because we still have breath, so we're very fortunate. We don't yet have COVID, and we don't know when it's going to come. And when, or if we do get sick, if we do contract this virus, then it's really difficult for us to chant that we lose the opportunity to go to the communal morning and evening chanting, and walking and sitting in meditation becomes very difficult. So this hasn't happened to us yet. We are not sick yet. Our bodies are still strong. So we should encourage each other in effort we can also have mindfulness over these minds of ours, knowing what states arise within them, and seeing how they're all inconstant or unstable, stressful and not-self, that all there is is arising and ceasing, that there's not really anything there, there's just this arising and ceasing, no being, no self, no other. We have this one who knows, this awakened awareness, caring for and looking after our minds, steadily bringing them to purity, cultivating the heart from the level of a uh, putujana, one who is thick with defilements, to a kalyanajana, 
one whose mind is good or beautiful, and then developing them to an Arya, to a noble being, a noble mind, one that is far away from the defilements. So may all of you set your hearts on this together. <laughs>